But we're looking backwards as we're looking forward because you, can, you don't really know how I've come into a kingdom for such a time as this unless I look back and see where I was. And we don't know how, how God can increase in my life and I can decrease in my life until I look at back and see what I have failed at and what I have succeeded at so that I can realize that this time belongs to God. Pastor Jimmy used that word, such a time as this. So when we look at that this morning, we're going to look quickly uh, at, at a couple of principles. R-E, R-E. You'll notice it in the dictionary if you go home and look it up. R-E, it has two meanings. One is an official letter, like from a lawyer, regarding R-E. But it's a, it's a Latin prefix. And if you look in your big old uh, Webster dictionary, there's two pages devoted completely to R-E. All the words that begin with R-E. R-E is a Latin prefix meaning again. And when you begin to think about all the words, recover, reconnect, rediscover, reuse, resign, reaffirm, repeat, retaliate, uh, refigure, rebound, remarriage, reevaluate, remix, all of those have one idea, what we got to do what? Again, we have to do it again. And when we look at why we are here, such a time as this, we look at why God must increase and we decrease. This is not a time for us to, to sit back and say, we really, have a, we really have it good, we have it made. We have a beautiful campus, it's all paid for. Beautiful arena down there, all paid for. Vans out here, all paid for. All the ministers are paid for. We have money going, we have missionary programs going, all of that's good. So I think this would be a good time to just sit down and breathe. But that's not true. If he's going to increase and we're going to decrease, we've got to look at the RE. And this morning, I'm, I've pulled out three or four of them that we'll look at quickly. Um, the first one is R-E-T-U-R-N, return. Isaiah 44, 22 says, I have blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions and like a cloud your sins, for I have redeemed you. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Redemption. He has redeemed us. And he says, I've blotted out your sins. The first R-E that we're looking at is return to the Lord. If there ever was a moment in time for this nation to return to the God of the Bible, it's now. If there was ever a moment by which congresses and senates all over the nation and in the big houses in Washington, D.C. turn to God, it's now. For this is such a time by which either we will serve the Lord and, and turn and understand that he has redeemed us again. He's brought us back this morning when I woke at five, I started walking up and down through the, uh, through the fifth wheel. And as I'm walking, I'm praying. I, 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 do, I say this almost every day. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for saving me. My salvation was not just when I was a 10-year-old boy at vacation Bible school. And uh, Pastor uh, Johnny Dar uh, gave that invitation. And I came up there to the Roseville Baptist Church and uh, over in this corner, and Brother Johnny told me how to be saved. It, it wasn't just an event for that moment. It's been an event now for a long time. And I wake up every morning and say, God, thank you for redeeming me. And every day, the principle of being saved is how we decrease and how he increases. Every day, you are, you are given 24 hours. You've got the same amount of time that I have. You have the same amount of time that everyone else has. What are we going to do with that time? And I know this is the, the day it gets really edgy here because you want to put all these resolutions. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to get on that. How many of you have one of those bicycles in your house? Only three of us? Five, four. All right. The reason you don't remember is because you've got it covered up with clothes. <laughs> Whenever we can't find anything, we go look on our riding bicycle that don't go anywhere, and we see we usually find stuff there. We're going to resolute. I'm going to do better. I'm going to be better. I'm going to, I'm going to sign up for everything. I'm going to learn three foreign languages this year. I'm going to learn to play the guitar. And, and then by the 16th of January, we've thrown it all out. But I am telling you, the first read that we're looking at is return to me because I have redeemed you. Maybe this is the day that you understand that Christ redeems you. 
He has blotted out your sin. The reason we are a family, and, and so many are, we have so many sick uh, trail scouts are out today. Christmas vacation is the middle. Many people are all gone traveling, won't be gathered back in until that school bell rings uh, this next week. But it doesn't matter where you are, who you are, what you're doing. The reason we are a body in Christ is we have been redeemed. That's what makes us family. So, return to me, for I have blotted out, like a thick cloud, your transgressions. And like a cloud, all of your sins have been blotted out. Now, Cole, you got any change on you? You got a quarter? Has anybody got a quarter? Who's got a quarter? Boy, you're way, Rosie would have a quarter. I need a closer quarter. If I, you know, uh, Mel, let's just say that you, after the service, you say, Hey, brother, I'll get two quarters. Brother Bob, I'm going to buy you a, I want to buy you a new car. You got a whole bag, Rosie. That's not, that's a British quarter. It's an English quarter, only Rosie. Mel, let's just say at the end of the service, you and Virginia come up to me and say, I'm going to buy you, Miss Jan, a new car. It's going to cost $50,000. It'd have to be used. <laughs> It'd be used. And I'd say, Brother Mayo, that's just wonderful, but that's just too much. That's just way too much. I can't let you do that. I want to I wanna put in. I want to put in some of that as well. So I'm going to give you 50 cents. <laughs> Now you only have to pay forty nine thousand nine hundred and ninety five dollars and fifty cents. Yeah. Now listen to me. Salvation by works is just like that. How insulting to the God of the universe that says, Well, I'm gonna help him save me. See, that's what works does. You think what little bit I can put in is going to keep me safe? And and the last call that I had last night was an unusual call, and someone I prayed for for years. And and we have sometimes have some interesting conversations. And and one of their issues is that they get saved and lost, and saved and lost sometimes. And lost. So let me tell you how frustrating that is, folks. If you could lose your salvation, you would. I know you people. Before dark, every one of us would be as lost and going to hell as we could be. If you could lose it, you would lose it. Give me those quarters back. <laughs> Rosie, I'm keeping yours. That's work. Salvation by works is just like that. You can't work up enough to make it happen. And even if you could make it happen, you can't make it stick. Because if we would lose it, if we could at all, we really would. The same God who saved you is the same God who's keeping you. He has redeemed you from the curse of the law, and he's going to keep you. Second re is renew. Isaiah 40, 29. Have you not known, have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He increases their strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings of eagles, and they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Isaiah 40. 29, 30, 31. Renew. Renew. This is the day that we're asking the Lord to renew our hearts. We need that renewal. Because it's the, again, re. It's the process of once again renew. When my wife uh, fixes a meal, Pastor Benny mentioned, we, we talk about food a lot. <laughs> But when Miss Jan fixes a meal, she'll oftentimes ask me what I want. And then I'll tell her, but that's not what's on the table when I get there. Now follow me. 
Because my wants sometimes do not match what's in the pantry. My wants sometimes does not match what's in the fridge. She, she already had thought out what she was going to do. See, the Lord's plan for you to renew is not conditional upon what you're suggesting he do in your life today. To renew means, you know what? But they who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Where are you going to get this strength to be in a time as this? Where are you going to get this strength to keep decreasing? You say, how much more can I decrease? Oh, a whole lot more. A whole lot more. This renewal that we need means we need to go back to it again. But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew strength. And we need it. All of us need to be stronger. At my wellness thing every year, I go for an annual wellness thing. It takes two and a half hours to go through all that. They come, and then they set you down. The doctor, he goes through on the big screen. He's showing you all this. says the same thing every year. This plaque is built up. You have the arteries of an 87-year-old man or whatever, and you need, we need to do this. And when he finishes up, he says, now we need to work on weights this year. We need to work. You need to do free weights. You need to do more because you've got, you got to build muscle mass. You're losing muscle. So all these things that the medical world says we must do, uh, and right now I, I'm taking 27 different supplements and vitamins. I don't know how many you're taking. But if you took everything that comes on your Facebook that says you need this or you're not going to live, you'd be spending about 9000 bucks a month. So we're putting everything into our mouth that we can humanly say, this will help me feel better. When sometimes the drive through at Dairy Queen is the very thing we need it the most. A large, <laughs> large dip cone, amen? <laughs> and double up on those vitamins tomorrow. One of our deacons sent me a picture about a month or so ago. And this is what we, we, we do. But anyway, he, he went to the drive through and he got a large dip cone. And he felt impressed to send me a pic of it. Now, I don't know if that was him confessing it. Or him showing, na, 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 na. But to renew means it comes from a different source, an outside source. It comes from something deeper than what I have ability to do. It comes from a source that is greater than me. So I'm asking you today to put the RE in front of that and renew. The third one is from Isaiah as well. I will dwell in the high and the holy place and also with him who is of a contrite heart, a lowly spirit, to revive the heart of the contrite. Revive, R-E, revive. We've talked about renew. We've talked about revive. We've talked about redeemed or return to me. Now, in the, the concept of revival, we're not talking about just a set meeting where we come together and, and see what the Lord's going to do. We're talking about we need revival. You know what music actually does in the church? Same thing it does. Uh, hey, uh, every decade has a song. Let me go back to the 60s. See if you can remember this. Profound impact this had on my life. She loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. She loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. She loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. And with a love like that, you know it can't be bad. That's profound. <laughs> Every generation has got a, a song. But for the redeemed, the song, the music of the soul is that reminder of reviving us through what is being played and what is being sung out. May I remind you that King David was a warrior, but he also sat with his guitar, lyre, harp, and he made beautiful melodies from the Psalms. Most of those things that we're reading in the book of Psalms was David talking to the Lord. Revival comes from the inside of our heart saying, I'm not right right now and I know it. Let me finish up from the book of Acts chapter 3. Repent therefore and return. See if you hear these REs. Repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come forth from the presence of the Lord and that he may send the restoring of all things which God has spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Acts 3, 19, 20, 21. Repent, refresh, restore. All concepts of the New Testament believer. I'm hearing more and more young preachers say that the Old Testament 
is really irrelevant for New Testament believers. In fact, this movement is, is catching on that we're, we're purposing not to preach from the Old Testament. Let me tell you how wrong this is. The apostles themselves quoted or referred to the Old Testament 651 times. Jesus himself, Jesus himself, 283 times, he referred back to the Old Testament. So more than 1,000 times, New Testament writers referred back to the Old Testament. For the Word of God is quick and powerful. It's the whole Word of God. It's not just the half of the Word of God. And I know what we're talking about. 95% of everything that's talked about, wrong sex and gender, comes from the Old Testament. And we want that out. You see, this is the generation that is going to mark out, stamp out, stomp out, do away with everything godly and holy or anything that God has said concerning judgment. And so while we do need to repent of our sin and while we do pray for a refreshing, we must also pray that God restores us and brings us back to where we need to be. R.E., there's more than 400 of these words that say again, again, again. We've got to go back, go to back again. Christianity is filled with going back. This whole thing that we're about to do now in just a moment is going back to 2,000 years ago when Jesus sat at the table with the 12 and he instituted what we call the Lord's Supper, what was then Passover. And again, how can you take the Old Testament out of the very thing that now con conditions the church in our relationship? The bread and the drink. We need to re it. Reaffirm ourselves into Christ. We need to repent. We need to rejoice. We need to restore. We need to replenish. All of that comes about not just by us standing up and saying, okay, that's what I want too. It comes about by a, a process. It is a process. And it's going to take a while to do. But it begins with a, a verbal or a nonverbal commitment to say, Lord, work on me. Work on me. I was standing in a garage uh, about to talk to someone about whatever needed to be years ago. And a lady walked in, went to the guy and said, fix it. And he said, what's, what's it doing? And you know how we, we make all these noise? Well, it's got a, when you put it in gear, it goes, kachu, kachu. And the, the, the. She said, I don't know what it's doing, just fix it. She turned around and walked out. She said, I'm not coming back till it's fixed. I wish the human soul could be that way where we take the engine out and say, now just fix it, Lord. There's a bunch of stuff going on here, but just fix it. He opened the car and looked at it. And he said, well, the first thing you're wrong with is the Taylor Swift thing playing in here. That was the bad noise it was making. <laughs> fix it. Lord, just fix it. Well, what all's wrong? Don't know. Just fix it. Return to me. Revive, repent, restore, replenish for a time as this, that he may increase, that I may decrease. Would you stand together with me? Been an unusual this morning, but God is in the unusual. God is in the distractions. God is in the unusual of, of how and when he works in, in, in our lives. I had a friend, Bailey Smith, preached all over the world. He was in a revival in a little bitty church out in western Oklahoma. When he was young, he spent seven days there in that church, and one little boy got saved. One of the deacons at that church, when he was leaving, said, Well, Brother Bailey, that wasn't much a revival, was it? He said, Depends on who you ask. One little boy got saved. We need to pull the engine out of our heart today and say, Lord, fix it. We're low on oil. We need to be replenished. We need to be restored. And Father, only you can do that. I don't know if you're ready to start a new year or not. Doesn't really matter. It's going to start. I don't know if you're prepared to be, to be more spiritual than you were in 2023 or not. I don't know. But I do know this. That he does need to do a work in your heart. And that every heart is different, every soul is different, every need is different, and yet he is the supplier of all need. 
For my God shall supply all you need according to his riches and glory. I can't work it up. I can't add to it. I can't put a gift in big enough that's going to change my relationship. That's from the, 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 the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart and in your life. Let's bow our heads now for a moment, shall we? Are you ready for this year? What needs to happen that didn't happen this year? How you need to pull the engine out and say, Father, work on me today. So we're just going to take a little time out here. If this is the day you say, you know, I can't buy my salvation. I can't help work it up, but I need to be saved. The gospel of Jesus Christ is that he came he lived a sinless life, shed his blood on the cross so that we could have a relationship with the Father. And in so doing, I keep being saved every day. For if I could lose my salvation, I surely would. I am kept by the Father. John 17, none of them that you have given to me have I lost. If you need to come, you come today. If this was the day you said, I want to join the church today, then you come and talk to one of these good men. But if today is the day you just need to take the engine out or the transmission out or something's not working in the soul or something out of step with you and the Father, or you and a brother and sister, or you and your wife, or you and your husband, your, your kids, your grandkids, and, and, the, and the Holy Spirit is hovering over, waiting to do the works, I love that in Genesis, the Holy Spirit hovered and waited for, for the voice of the Father to say, let there be light. In the moment that time began, light and darkness was spread apart so that we can tell right and wrong. The purpose of time is not to know how to make it to your train or to the, to the bus station or, or to the flight on time. The purpose of time is to reveal to you that every moment you have belongs to him. Every moment. What are you going to do? with what he has given you and what he will give you in 2024. Father, help us this day. There are, there are many of us who want to return to the joy of our salvation. We need to return. Bring it back again. Help us this day to get ready for not just a new year, but for the time that you give us in the year, in Jesus' name. You need to come this morning. Feel the openness of the altar for you. Feel the liberty of the Holy Spirit to obey him in whatever he tells you to do. speaking to you, yield to him, for he hovers over your heart, waiting to hear the voice of the Father.
know that chorus singing. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. Full in his wonderful face. The things of earth and the things of earth. Just the instrument playing now. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed before the Lord. Are you sure that you've done business with the Lord? Do you need to be saved? Don't leave this building until you have claimed that redemption that He's provided for you. Right where you stand, you can say, Dear Jesus, I ask you into my heart. I ask you to save me, to redeem me, to buy me back from my sin. I trust in you. I know you died for me. I will live for you in Jesus' name. That's a confession, and it begins there. It's followed by going in there. Baptism is the first act of obedience. You need to do that. Do it today as the Holy Spirit leads you. So, Father, we do thank you for the precious grace you've given us, for the re in our lives. Redeemed, return, restore, repent, replenish. I think of it. You've identified the time in which we serve you. You've given us a place that you can increase and we can decrease. As we experience this communion together, I pray for all those who are away from us today, still traveling, those who are homesick, those who are in hospitals, and those in camps. I pray that your grace upon them as well. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Thank you and be seated. Pastor Benny. We're thankful as we observe the Lord's Supper that as we move through it, we think about the impact that it should have on us in this solemn assembly. In Corinthians, it, it talks about they met together, and as they would meet together and have this time, it was the focus upon what he has done for us, the broken body and the blood. The blood that was shed covers our sins. The only thing that we can say when we get to heaven is he paid it. He paid it. He paid it. He covered my sins. Have you not houses to eat and drink or despise the church of God and shame them and have not? What shall I say to you that you praise? For I have received of the Lord which also I delivered unto you that the Lord Jesus the same night in which we was betrayed took bread. Every nation of the world eats bread. It is the staff of life. In the many nations I've served and sang in, Bread was always there. In fact, it was usually the first thing that I would find that I could live on for 10 days or 15 days. My favorite bread is in India. It's called naan. Just a beautiful baked bread, but it's the staff of life. When Jesus broke that bread, and the Jewish bread, was, it's, it's different. This was an unleavened bread, so... It had a crunch to it. All of their bread does because they soak it with olive oil and all of that. But when he broke the bread, it was not only the breaking of the bread to eat, but it was the breaking of the, of the bread of his life. No greater symbol than the bread because it nourishes our body and comes between uh, us and not eating anything. We're malnourished. But to receive the bread of Christ is to receive the blessing. For he says, my body was broken just as I've broken this bread. So bread means a whole lot in the, in the diet of, of life and in the diet of your spiritual walk. The unleavened bread that you're about to, to eat was baked by one of our families. <clears throat> it has no spiritual meaning. And it's, it's not a <clears throat> transubstantiation. In other words, you don't become that bread, but it's a symbol. That you're about to eat and take something that Jesus did 2,000 years ago. 
bread, the nourishment of our life. Jesus at the 12, when he broke the bread, he asked them to, to go into a moment. <clears throat> now he knew the one was going to betray him, and yet he handed him the bread. All of us are not <clears throat> alike. We're not all of us of one mind. We're supposed to be one mind, one heart. But we're to use this moment now to reflect on our own soul. Is Jesus Christ being the bread, the nourishment for you? Your spiritual needs are being met. So that's part of what this symbol is all about. So before you take it, as you hold this little piece of, a, of an unleavened bread that has been broken already, you're part of not only a tradition of 2,000 years, you're part of it going on right now. And when we're all dead and gone and our grandchildren and their, and their children are in this place and they're worshiping, guess what? They'll be taking of the same nourishment that we received, the bread of Christ. So we're going to take now just for a moment to solemnly look inside of our soul. If there's a thing you need to confess today, if there's a sin you need to confess, pastor has already read that scripture, how important it is not to eat or to drink unworthily of that. Would you bow your heads with me and pray and consider before we eat the bread, is there anything wrong, Lord? Do I need to confess? Do I need to apologize? Do I need to do anything in the world before I say that I'm in complete union with you? Because that's what the bread means. I am at peace and union with you. That night in the upper room, Jesus was there with his disciples. And as Brother Bob said, the one that was going to betray him, he treated him just as well as he did the others. But he said, take this bread, for it is my body, broken for you, and eat. After the same manner, he took the cup when he had supped. I've taken communion in so many different ways so many different uh, drinks some was wine real wine some wasn't this was Welch's wine that's not the meaning or the message it's not the symbol the symbol is the blood when we remove our talk of the blood of Christ when we, when we take that out of the dialect of Christianity, as many want to today, we're removing the very thing that brought us together. So when you take this cup today, it's, the word covenant is an agreement between two. Jesus said, this day, there's a covenant with you. No longer the Old Testament covenant, but a new covenant I give unto you. And I do not understand how it works. I don't understand how he did it I still don't understand the cross how he could do it but I do know that he did it and he did it for us would to God we be found 50 years from now doing this very same thing the very same way because the covenant stands between you and the Lord and this new covenant he said is written in my blood now, that doesn't make it bloody or gory. It makes the sacrifice that he gives for us. And so as you ponder now for just a moment and you think about your relationship with him, it's all by the blood of Christ. To remove that one factor of Christianity, we're just like everybody else who meets. We're just another group. So let's take a moment. And thank God for this covenant that's written in his blood before we take it. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as of as you drink it in the remembrance of me. I'm going to share a prayer that my grandma says. Lord, make us thankful for these blessings for Christ's sake. 